Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all very much for coming out. And, uh, I know you all, many people need to be at home pondering how they're going to vote tomorrow in the election. Thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, which is an independent American culture center based right here in the West India Company. Uh, the main thing that we do is to bring American speakers. We were uh, pleased, we were delighted when we could get, we talk in terms of getting, when we could get Peter Bergen, uh, who's, uh, uh, I've, I've long been a fan of his work uh, as a journalist, his work with CNN, his work as a, a foreign uh, affairs uh, writer. And uh, his book, Manhunt, is, which is a really gripping story about the 10-year search for Osama bin Laden. And then when we could get him on the 11th anniversary of September 11th, it was just, uh, it seemed like, well, this is uh, just perfect. Uh, as if that weren't enough, we have um, a special guest here tonight. And I would just like to take a moment to uh, ask him to come up. His name is Lieutenant Steve Brown. He's retired. Uh, from uh, Squad One Fire Department in Brooklyn. He was part of the, of the company, the companies that originally responded to the World Trade Center. And uh, he happens to be in Amsterdam, and so we asked him if he might come tonight and uh, maybe answer one or two questions about uh, that day and his life since then. So if you wouldn't mind uh, giving a hand to Lieutenant Steve Brown. Uh, Lieutenant Brown, um, maybe you could just tell us uh, very briefly, uh, give us an overview of uh, uh, what you, uh, w what happened on that day. I mean, just two sentences, uh, the scope of what happened to your, uh, your squad, your company. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you know I can't do anything in right. two sentences. <laughs> um, long story short, I was off duty at the time, responded into the firehouse uh, with some other guys that were off duty. We made our way into the uh, Trade Center uh, command post, and we met with the command post. And then they sent us out to basically do basically whatever we wanted, because there was really, at that point, no command structure. So what we did from start to finish, basically, was search. Search for anybody that uh, could possibly be alive or anybody that we could find. Um, it was there from the beginning, I guess, maybe a half hour after the second tower collapsed, and uh, I personally stayed there the first 36 hours because uh, I just couldn't leave to go back home at that point. And then uh, our company had lost 12 guys altogether. Uh, I know that sounds like a lot, but some individuals were off, and it was to change the tour. So when anything big happened, everybody jumped on the fire truck and, and everybody went in. And that's how we lost so many uh, people. Um, Basically, from there on, all we did was search uh, every hole that we could find, uh, anything that we could find, to see if we could find anybody alive. And as I had said earlier in the day, during all of that time, there was one individual that was found alive the next day, and uh, she was the last one that was pulled from the pile of life. Wow. Yeah. And uh, what, uh, the 11 years since then, what, ha you've be have you become a public speaker? Have you become a... Uh, Absolutely not. <laughs> Um, again, long story short, I, I've been around and I've spoken about it in a number of places. Of course, I've been here about five, this is my fifth time, and that's because I formed some friendships with some people here, most notably Roberta Enskede, who got this whole thing started. And then I, I kind of thought that it was the right thing to do for everybody else. Uh, not for myself, I could care less, really, about whether I go out and talk and everything, but a lot of people, and I mean worldwide, did wonderful things for us and they wanted to know about it. So I was very proud to tell what we did and, and what happened there, Any, anything that I could do. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you for, for coming here tonight. Uh, really appreciate it. Now, also thanks, Roberta Enskede and Shak Sane from the Rotterdam Fire Department. Thanks. You know, we didn't want, we, we were very, uh, uh, we were really looking forward to this evening, but at the same time, we didn't wa want uh, the, the feeling that since this is uh, the anniversary of 9 11, 
that you know the book is about the hunt for bin Laden. We didn't want to, in any way to feel like we're sort of celebrating retribution or something, and I'm sure Peter doesn't uh, want that either. But uh, it was just uh, really uh, a wonderful happenstance that uh, Lieutenant Brown was here and gives us a different uh, perspective on the day. So thank you again. Um, uh, Peter Bergen is going to talk about, um, actually I don't know exactly what he's going to talk about, but it's going to, have some, it's going to be wide ranging and it's going to have to do with this, this uh, very broad topic. But before he does, uh, I want to introduce the moderator. Peter will talk and then there will they'll be a moderated, moderated discussion. Uh, the moderator is well known to many of you. Uh, Chris Kaina is a VPRO journalist since uh, 1984, I think. He is also a documentary filmmaker, and he has been uh, an interviewer for the uh, evening program Gesprek op Twee. He's also a board member of the John Adams Institute and a regular moderator for the John Adams. For us and in his journalistic capacity, he has interviewed many major figures, including Salman Rushdie, Madeleine Albright, Francis Fukuyama, Elie Wiesel, Amos Oz, and Simon Shama. Please welcome our moderator, Chris Kainen. Good evening, and uh, thanks for coming, because apart from the elections, there's also a football match tonight, as we all know. So we're very glad you're here with so many. Um, when John F. Kennedy was shot on November 22nd, 1963, my mother was 48. And for her and her generation, it was one of those moments. You always remembered where you were and how you heard it, and you made sure your children got to know that story. John Kennedy never left her life since, nor ours, for he looked at us, at us at breakfast, at lunch, and at dinner. His picture was on the wall behind our dinner table. Eleven years ago, on this day of the year, I was 48. And that sad day, someone came into my life, and I didn't have to put his picture up for him. For him and his deadly ideology, never to leave my professional life again. And I also remember exactly, and I will as long as I live, where I was at 14 minutes to 3 that afternoon, which was 8.46 a.m. New York time, 11 years ago. I'm sure that goes for all of you here and for most people around the world of our generation. Enter Osama bin Laden. If for anyone in this room here tonight, apart, of course, from Lieutenant uh, Steve Brown, of course, but uh, when I conceived this text, I didn't know he would be here. But if for anyone in this room here tonight, the 11th September attacks on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon have been even more than that moment he will never forget, but as much as a life-changing event, it must be Peter Bergen. Not that it was then that Osama bin Laden entered his life, because that had happened some years before, but from then on, the Sheikh certainly never left his life again. Since then, Mr. Bergen has, so it seemed, considered it his obligation to explain Osama bin Laden, his ideas and his deeds to the world. Now, if you think that would be enough of a task for one man, I'll mention a few of Mr. Bergen's other recent activities. He's the director of the National Security Studies Program at the New American Foundation, which is a nonpartisan think tank in Washington. He's also a research fellow at New York University's Center of Law and Security. In 2008, he was an adjunct lecturer at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and an adjunct professor at the Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins. And he's also on the editorial board of Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, and he has testified before several congressionals and Senate commissions. And he's a member of the National Security Preparedness Group, which is a successor to the 9-11 Committee. And there's more, but I'll leave it at that, because otherwise you might get the impression that Mr. Bergen left the muddy trenches of journalism and spent an easy academic life behind a desk. And I think and I hope Mr. Bergen will agree with me if I say that first and foremost he has always stayed a journalist. He is still CNN's national security analyst, but like I said, more than all the other mentioned activities, Mr. Bergen is the chroniqueur of the life of a man that has kept the world of the United States of America under his spell for a good 10 years, if not the whole world. In those 10 years, Peter Bergen published three books. He wrote 
Holy War Incorporated, Inside the Secret World of Osama Bin Laden, that was in 2001 already. The Osama Bin Laden I Know in 2006, and The Longest War, The Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda, that was in 2011. And when these 10 years ended on May 1st, 2011, he immediately must have started working on the fourth, and that will be the focus of our conversation tonight, Manhunt, the 10 years search for Bin Laden from 9-11 to Abbottabad, 2012. That was this year. I don't think there's anybody in the Western world, not even in the darkest corner of the CIA headquarter in Langley, who knows more about Osama Bin Laden than Peter Bergen. So we couldn't think of a better guest for this day. Please welcome Peter Bergen. Thank you, Chris, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Russell, for the invitation to come to speak to the John Adams Institute. And thank you to my published house of books who published my book in Dutch today. Thank you also, all of you, for coming tonight. Um, so I thought I would try and briefly uh, talk about the five major themes of my book about the hunt for bin Laden, and then Chris and I will have a conversation which we'll get into more detail about it, and then we'll open it to uh, questions from you. Um, I've written four books about al-Qaeda. This was the first book that I was really able to sort of sit down and say, what am I trying to say, rather than just start writing and writing and writing, and, and really have a plan about what I was going to say. And I thought that the book had to answer five or six questions as part of the narrative uh, of this book. And one of them was, what was Bin Laden doing between 9-11 and May 1st, 2011, when he was killed? And as a subset of that, what was Al-Qaeda doing? How was it doing, you know, how, how well was the group doing? And to what extent was Bin Laden in touch with it? And to what extent did he direct it? And that was one big thing I had to try and address. The second big thing I had to ad address was in a sense, the Agatha Christie story at, at the CIA, because this was not a James Bond story. There was a James Bond element in it, in it uh, later, which is the actual raid. This was really an Agatha Christie detective story, and, and the evolution of that story at the CIA was another big thing I had to think about. Another big thing I had to think about was Joint Special Operations Command, which uh, basically you know, led the raid, in a sense and the evolution of US Special Forces. Because if George W. Bush had ordered this raid in 2002, it probably would have not worked. Uh, even, even in 2011, there were problems. But, you know, the helicopter went down. But in 2002, the people involved in this operation would not have had uh, the same level of experience that they, that they had. And I'll get into that in more detail in a minute. And then another big thing I had to think about was the US-Pakistan relationship, which was arguably at its worst, just in the period where this raid happened. Um, and another, another big thing I had to think about was President Obama as a decision maker, because at the end of the day, this book is in a sense about presidential decision making. And just as uh, you mentioned Kennedy, uh, Chris, in you know, the portrait in your house, just as Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis you know, those six days where Kennedy basically was under tremendous pressure from his generals to perhaps engage in a nuclear war with the Soviet Union, uh, he made all the right decisions and prevented that happening. Um, now, this is not preventing a nuclear war, obviously. That's, the stakes were much higher in 1960, in the early 60s. But, you know, finding bin Laden was some, certainly something that, you know, the victims of 9-11 and their families and, and, and the United States in general uh, wanted very much. And uh, I think President Obama's decision uh, to do this is, uh, you know, historians will look at this for a long time uh, because it's a very, I think, admirable uh, set of decisions that were made. And so let me perhaps start with President Obama and his decision-making process briefly. One scene that I have in the book is uh, bin La uh, uh, President Obama receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo in December, mid-December 2009. Now, it was kind of an awkward moment because a week before president, uh, pre the president had authorized 
uh, a surge of 30,000 troops into Afghanistan, which was widely known, and he's accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. And he used the opportunity of his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, probably for the first time in history of the Nobel Peace Prize, to explain his philosophy of war. Um, and his philosophy of war, I think, and it's a beautifully written speech, and of course the president is a very, very good writer, and I think, I'm pretty sure he wrote most of it himself. Um, he basically said, look, much as I admire Gandhi or Martin Luther King, uh, pacifism and non-aggression would not have stopped the Nazis. And negotiation with Al-Qaeda is unlikely to produce anything meaningful. And I'm not endorsing violence, I'm just simply saying that Violence is sometimes necessary because human beings do irrational things and violence is sometimes the only response. Um, and I think that speech, most people didn't pay a lot of attention to what he said, but it turns out that President Obama is arguably one of the most militarily aggressive presidents in decades. And it's something that people do not, on the left or the right really, on the right they don't want to really credit him for that. And on the left they, don't, they can't seem to really process that fact. But if you think about, this is a president who tripled the number of troops in Afghanistan. He, there are six times more drone strikes in Pakistan than under President Bush. We're have, fighting a covert war in Yemen. In fact, the number two Al-Qaeda leader out Yemen was killed yesterday by, I'm sure, an American drone strike. Um, we, president intervened in Libya in nine days. It took Bill Clinton two years to intervene in the Balkans under similar circumstances, and you know, there are a lot, many other examples. So President Obama is a decision maker. He's actually very decisive. He's very comfortable with the use of American power. And as I was thinking about this, he's the first American political figure who, for, for, for decades, who what he did or did not do in Vietnam is not an issue. So if you think about Senator John Kerry or Senator John McCain, their political careers are largely bound up with what they did or did not do in Vietnam, what they did in Vietnam. Uh, Bill Clinton, Dick Cheney, George W. Bush, the issues of, uh, it was all an issue for them about the fact that they didn't fight in Vietnam. And of course, President Obama is too young for all that. He was too young to have either served or not served. And he's not burdened by the Vietnam uh, question. In fact, when Dick Holbrook would bring up Vietnam in, in the meetings they had about the Afghan surge, Obama and I, I think his younger advisors were sort of bored by that and thought it was irrelevant. Um, and, and uh, not a useful analogy. So the president makes this decision, and, and Chris and I will get into it in more detail, but Obama as a decision maker is a big part of the book. Another big part of the book is the rise of Joint Special Operations Command, which I think actually Donald Rumsfeld rarely gets much credit, um, probably anywhere the, the, the right now, but this is really something that Donald Rumsfeld was instrumental in making happen. The budget uh, for, for special operations went up dramatically under Rumsfeld's tenure, and he was very much, you know, he wanted a light transformational military, and this was part of it. Um, and General Stanley McChrystal, uh, you know, is sort of one of the people who comes out of this book very favorably because it was he who turned special operations into a pretty effective fighting force, into an unbelievably effective fighting force. And he did that in a lot of different ways. Uh, basically integrating the use of special forces and intelligence gathering into a completely seamless kind of um, mixture so that a, a, a raid would happen in Iraq by the by joint special operations and they would pick up intelligence, they process it within a matter of hours and it would allow them to do another raid. Uh, and Stanley McChrystal took advantage of the fact that a lot of broadband uh, internet bandwidth uh, was expanding in 2004, 2005, and he was able to send intelligence back to the United States, get it tr documents translated very quickly. And so he, he really, and he also had an intellectual concept, which I think was uh, uh, new, which was since Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a, was a network and not a conventional army, Joint Special Operations Command had to become a network itself instead of a kind of, you know, kind of hierarchical conventional military. So the changes that General Stanley McChrystal and others made in Joint Special Operations made this, made the US Navy SEAL operation in Abdabad much more likely to, to basically work. In fact, President Obama, when he ordered the raid, the one thing he didn't really concern himself too much with was the issue of whether or not it would actually work from a military point of view. Obviously he was concerned, but that wasn't his principal concern. The other concerns were, you know, was bin Laden there? Would there be a firefight with the Pakistanis? Would there be civilian casualties? Uh, you know, these, these kinds of uh, concerns. 
Another big part of the story is, is the CIA Bagatha Christie story. Um, needless to say, it was kind of complicated, difficult to find bin Laden. I've been doing interviews with the Dutch media recently in the last two or three days. And some people have said, why did it take so long? And my, my answer to that is, you know, it took 15 years for the, uh, for the um, Israelis to find Eichmann after the Holocaust, not for a lack of trying. Um, and bin Laden wasn't making the kinds of obvious mistakes that get you caught. He wasn't talking on a cell phone. He wasn't using email. Uh, the people around him were not motivated by money, so a cash reward wasn't going to work. Um, but he did make a mistake at the end of the day, which was he wanted to remain relevant. Because if he stopped communicating entirely, he would never have been found. But he wanted to continue to communicate with his group, and he wanted to continue to communicate with the media. And at a certain point, the CIA really began to focus on the issue of how was he communicating, because it was fairly obvious through a courier network. And Chris and I can perhaps get into more detail about how they zeroed in on this particular courier, but it was very complex. And one of the issues I realized I had to deal with in the book also was the issue of coercive interrogation. Uh, because uncomfortably for people who might be opposed to coercive interrogation, um, some of the information that led to the courier did come from people who were coercively interrogated. Um, now, I'm not a, a defender of coercive interrogation. I'm just looking at this as sort of a journalist and trying to sort out what is true. Um, and in my view, much of this information could have been elicited just by conventional interrogation. But that said, the fact is coercive interrogation was applied to uh, at least one or two people who helped find the courier. Um, and then there was the, you know, the, 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 I opened the book with, uh, in a way, I mean, one of the problems about writing a book like this is we all know what happened. <laughs> so so um, I wanted to sort of begin in a way that wasn't completely obvious and, and might have a lot of you know, interest and news for people who hadn't followed Al-Qaeda as much as uh, you know, people in the national security community. And so I, re I open with bin Laden. What was bin Laden doing in Abdabad? Because here's the world's most wanted man. He's living in a fairly large compound with about 24 other people, including three of his wives and a dozen of his kids and grandkids. Now, most fugitives don't take their wives and kids with them when they disappear, trying to, you know, the world's most wanted man. It's kind of counterintuitive that he also had this very large family with him. And I paint a picture of what that family life was like, and I was able to get inside the compound uh, two weeks before the Pakistanis demolished it, which helped me think about how these, how these families were living. And uh, bin Laden was living there with his 29-year-old uh, youngest wife, Amal, the a Yemeni, and uh, two older wives, one of whom was 54 and the other one was 62. The two older wives, by the way, have PhDs. Uh, these were highly educated women who knew that they were mar marrying, uh, getting into a polygamous marriage. They also knew that they were marrying somebody who was a jihadi war hero in their view, and that's one of the attractions he had for, that, that, that they found in him. Um, they're true believers in the cause. They were with bin Laden. One of them, the 62-year-old Korea, the oldest wife, traveled from her exile in Iran in the summer of 2010 to meet with bin Laden uh, after nine years. So she actually volunteered to go from Iran through Waziristan to Abdabad, where bin Laden was living, to be with him. And bin Laden was leading, leading kind of a fairly contented domestic life with his three wives and his dozen kids and grandkids. They were growing their own crops. Uh, he, you know, he was occasionally making videos. And in his room, I found a Just for Men uh, hair dye, uh, which is a Pakistani version, which he was using to dye his beard for these uh, appearances in the media. Um, and he was, in a, in a way, it was a comfortable life for the world's most wanted man. I mean, he was reading anti-American books. He was reading anti-Zionist literature. He was watching Al Jazeera. He was watching old tapes of himself. He was listening to BBC Arabic. Um, he was probably keeping up his religious, very, you know, he's somebody who was praying seven times a day, fasting twice a week. Um, and he was with his family. Uh, on the other hand, it was a prison. It was a prison of his own making. Um, and this is a guy who liked playing soccer and volleyball. This is a guy who um, would boast about the fact that he, was, he could ride 40 miles a day. He would take his sons on hikes through the Torabora Mountains that would last for a dozen hours. So it must have been confining to be in his prison, yet at the same time, uh, he was in his own mind safe. Um, and uh, he 
Of course, he wasn't safe in the end. And it was inevitable in my mind that he would be captured or killed. Uh, but uh, you know, the surprise was, I mean, I was as surprised as anybody else that it, it happened when it did. I thought that the trail had really gone cold. Um, and uh, in fact, it had. From December 14th, 2001, when he disappeared at the Battle of Tara Bora, more or less around that date, till August of 2010, there was no leads on bin Laden of any nature. There were what the CIA referred to as Elvis sightings, where people would say they'd seen bin Laden somewhere. And they had, every, every, every Elvis sighting had to be you know, followed up on. Um, and eventually, you know, they began to focus on this compound in Abtabad. Now, when I wrote this book in English, it came out on May 1st of this year. Um, and five days later, uh, Mitt Romney said any president would have made this decision, including uh, Jimmy Carter. Well, Jimmy Carter made a form of this decision on the Iran hostage uh, crisis, which made, made him a one-term president. Uh, so, and if President Joe Biden had been president by his own admission, and of course he ran to be president, uh, he would have been against this decision. And Robert Gates, who started working in the White House for Richard Nixon when Obama was 13, was advising against this raid. And General James Cartwright, who was Obama's favorite general, the number two military advisor, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he was advocating a drone strike. So on the crucial meeting on Thursday, April 28th, when they made a decision, or the decision was, the final decision kind of came down. Joe Biden and Secretary Gates and James Cartwright all said various versions of do something else or wait, or there's too many risks involved. And Liam Panetta and Hillary Clinton and Admiral Mike Mullen, the top military advisor to President Obama, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, all said you should do the raid. And uh, you know, so his most senior national security advisors were evenly split. And it's easy to say I'd make a decision when you know what the outcome is, but this was actually a very, very complicated decision. There were so many things that could go wrong. Bin Laden, there was no evidence that Bin Laden lived there. There was, there was circumstantial case that he lived there, but there was no evidence that Bin Laden lived in Abtabad. There was also the possibility of helicopters going down, and one did. There was also the possibility of a firefight with the Pakistanis. Uh, after all, U.S.-Pakistani relations now were, were at, really at a low point. Um, so I don't think this was an easy decision. And balanced against all that, there was also uh, there, were, there was doing nothing is a very natural human impulse. So let's push, push this decision off. But there were risks in pushing the decision down the road. For a start, the lunar cycle was on the on the weekend that the raid happened. The lunar cycle was right at the moment when you wanted the raid, which is no moon. Uh, in Abtabad, um, and you'd have to wait another month for that to happen. And the longer you waited, the more people knew. Because the more you operationalize something, even if people don't know every aspect of what's happening, the, the, it was clear that something, you know, there were SEALs being trained, people had to fuel helicopters, you know, there's more and more people who are beginning to know aspects of this situation. And, you know, there's a kind of phrase in Washington of the, you know, if you want to keep a secret in Washington, you don't tell anybody. And, uh, you know, they've been very, for a long time, that's what they did. They just didn't tell anybody. If you look at the, you know, there have been some reports that Valerie Jarrett, you know, this uh, advisor of uh, President Obama's knew about it. And I mean, it's completely nonsensical. The only people who knew about this in the White House were the people on the National Security Council staff and, uh, uh, you know, maybe a dozen people. And then at the White House, this is initially, at the White House, at the CIA, there were maybe, you know, a couple of dozen other people and the Joint Special Operations Command initially was only Admiral McRaven, who is one of the sort of heroes of this book, uh, who basically you know, organized the operation. Before I go to, to Chris, I just wanted to, because this is a part of the book that I really like, um, Admiral McRaven uh, wrote a book himself called Special Operations, which is an historical account of eight successful operations, seven of them in World War II, and one of them was a raid on Entebbe where, of course, the Israeli hostages were rescued. Now, the person who ran that operation was Jonathan Netanyahu, who's one of the heroes of McRaven's book. Jonathan Netanyahu is Bibi Netanyahu's oldest brother, and he was killed in the operation. Uh, and Netanyahu is an exceptional officer who read Machiavelli to relax. And he, he, <laughs> he, 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 when, he rescued, when, they, when they ran the Entebbe operation, this is, and this is very relevant to how McRaven sort of thinks. 
when they did the Israeli operation uh, to rescue the hostages in Uganda, no one could conceive that somebody would, you know, that a group of soldiers would fly from Israel to Uganda to rescue these hostages. It was just, no one expected that. And when they landed, when the Israeli soldiers landed, they were wearing Ugandan military uniforms. They were driving the same type of Mercedes that a Ugandan general would drive. And so when they went to, they didn't, they rescued the hostages in three minutes at the airport where they were being held. And so, and you know, McRaven also has another very interesting uh, special forces type uh, operation where you may recall that the Mussolini was uh, they'd taken hostage by um, anti-fascist partisans. And the Nazis rescued Mussolini in the middle of the war. And they did it by sending in hang gliders to where this hotel where he was being held. They didn't fire a shot. And the whole thing happened very quickly. So McRaven, when he was thinking about this raid on Abdabad, took these general principles of special forces operations, which is, needless to say, surprise. Uh, a very important thing is a repetition. They, they, in the new Navy SEAL book, he, in, in the 60 Minutes interview this Navy SEAL just did, they rehearsed this mission 100 times in three or four weeks. Um, obviously, you know, keeping it simple in a way uh, the people involved in these operations also have a great sense of purpose. Uh, clearly killing or capturing bin Laden was something that everybody on the SEALs you know, wanted to do. Uh, so McRaven uh, constructed what is you know, a sort of almost perfect special operations uh, mission. Uh, and the final point on, on that, Admiral Mike Mullen, who I spoke to on the record, was very keen for, to put something on the record to me. He said it was President Obama who made the, the military operation bigger than it had been. Because when McRaven first conceived of the operation, he thought that one of the kind of ideas, some of the messages that he was receiving was, don't do it in such a way that it really angers the Pakistanis. So he did, it was not as large an operation. It didn't have as many backup helicopters. It didn't have as many people involved. But President Obama at one of these National Security Council's meetings said, you know, the main priority is getting our guys out. And uh, as a result of which, they put more Chinook CH-47 helicopters in as backup. So not only was President Obama, I think, made the right decision and under very complex circumstances, but he also made the operation a better operation uh, than it, it might have been. So with that, uh, Chris. Thank you very much. Now, for maybe many people don't know what to vote tomorrow. For the 6th of November, you made it a little easier, I think. Um, we used to have, do you want some water? Thank you. We used to have uh, an evangelical talk show host here in the Netherlands who, with every interview, after about 15 minutes, he asked, and when did Jesus enter your life? Now, I, <laughs> I will not ask you that, but uh, I mentioned that it was not on 9-11 uh, that Osama bin Laden entered your life. But when did he enter your life? Well, you know, the Trade Center uh, was attacked in February 26, 1993, by a group of guys, who, many of whom had served and many of whom had fought in Afghanistan against the Soviets or had been involved in that. And I was living in Manhattan in the late 80s and early 90s, and this was, seemed to me like a very interesting news story. Um, and as I looked into it, the common link between everybody involved in the attack on the Trade Center the first time was that they had some connection to Afghanistan. So myself and Peter Arnett went to Afghanistan. We did a documentary about Afghanistan saying in mid-1993 mid that Afghanistan was likely to be sought the source of additional international terrorism. That unfortunately turned out to be true. Mm -hmm. And then in '96. The New York Times wrote about a guy called Osama bin Laden who was financing Islamic extremist movements. And since the people involved in the Trade Center attack in 93 seem to be part of an organization and organizations have leaders, I went to my bosses at CNN and I said, I think this guy is responsible for the, first, for the Trade Center attack in 93. And they said, uh, OK. And uh, <laughs> you know, go and you know, go I mean, they're, they're, they say go and find him. I mean, to, you know, to their enormous credit, because it was they didn't know who Osama bin Laden was. It wasn't really clear how important he was. It was going to cost a fair amount of money and time and effort and some risk to go and do this, because of course at that time, bin Laden was living in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, which, by the way, 
a week before we arrived, they banned filming the Taliban. Uh, of because you did find him a year we, later. We did find it, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. But so the Taliban had banned the filming of living beings about a week before we left for, to go and <laughs> shoot, uh, to shoot the interview with bin Laden. So, yeah, we found him eventually. And one of the reasons it was hard to find him after 9 11, it, was, it wasn't easy to find him in, in 1997. It was a, a, quite a performance. Yeah. Okay. Can you describe this, this encounter? Yeah. In 1997? Um, You know, I mean, it was pretty exciting. I mean, it, it took place on a, you know, on a mountaintop in March in Afghanistan, probably 6,000 feet up in the middle of the night. They told us that we couldn't bring anything with us, no equipment, no watches, nothing except our clothes. Uh, they provided a camera. Um, they searched us. They blindfolded us. They drove us around through the middle of the night. And then we arrived... Uh, around midnight I calculated at a small hut and it was a hut that was probably used by shepherds in, in the mountains and a few hours later bin Laden appeared out of the darkness and he was you know he was about your height um, mm. and very thin and he carried himself like a cleric he I didn't really know what to expect and I didn't we really didn't know very much about him compared to obviously what we now know he um, he wasn't friendly he wasn't unfriendly he He came to make a set of political statements, which is the reason we were there. Why was he, you know, why he, he had declared war against the United States in an Arab language newspaper. No one paid any attention. We were there to find out why was he declaring war against the United States? Who were the targets? Uh, who was he? The piece ran on CNN, I'd say, in late May of 1997. No one paid any attention at all. And um, in August of 1998, Al-Qaeda blew up two American embassies in Africa almost mm. simultaneously. And from that point forward, it was clear that this guy wasn't, it wasn't just posturing, he was serious. And, mm. you know, he, many of the victims, by the way, who died in Kenya and Tanzania and they, when the embassies blew up were Muslim civilians because Kenya and Tanzania have a very substantial population of Muslims. And uh, most of the victims were Kenyans and Tanzanians. They mm. weren't Americans. Mm. While speaking to him, did you, did you in any way feel that you that you, he connected to you or you to him, or were you just an instrument? I mean, it wasn't that kind of thing. I mean, it was, it was you know, he was, it, it was not a social occasion. It was a, no. it was an interview. And he, he wasn't, there wasn't much of a connection uh, yeah. or, or there wasn't, he wasn't unpleasant. Uh, but, you know, he's also surrounded by, you know, heavily armed guys with rocket propelled grenades and submachine guns. So it's not like, being interviewed at the House uh, John Adams Institute, it's a little bit more, <laughs> you know. And it was a, you know, somewhat, it wasn't intimidating, but it was, uh, it was that, that was the scene. That ah. At that time, you say one year later, everybody realized, but at that time, did you realize how dangerous he was? No, because he hadn't done anything, at least that we knew of. I mean, now we know that, in fact, he'd been training people in Somalia to attack Americans. In Somalia, we know that he had tried to blow up at a hotel in Yemen that was housing American servicemen going to Somalia in 92, but none of that was clear to us at the time. Although he referred to these things, but I didn't, we didn't really understand them so much. Um, but, you know, I mean, he was just, what, I, after the interview, I was, it, was all, it seemed all very interesting. He was very serious, the people around him were very serious, but, you know, it, at that point, it just seemed like rhetoric, potentially. Hmm. Did you did you realize how central he was to, to Al-Qaeda? Or let me put it differently. Would there ever been have been an Al-Qaeda without him? I don't think so. I mean, I, I have a sort of unfashionable, perhaps, view of history, which is that certain people change history. It's not great impersonal forces. And it's very hard to explain why the French were in Moscow or outside Moscow in 1812 without Napoleon. And it's very hard to explain the Holocaust, I think, without Hitler. I think it's very hard to explain Al-Qaeda. I mean, I'm not trying to compare Napoleon and Hitler. These are mm. much more significant historical figures. But Al-Qaeda was bin Laden's idea. He founded it with a, two, a dozen other guys, all guys, of course, uh, in, uh, in two weekends of, in August of 1988. And 9-11 was his strategic conception. You know, and it was a very stupid one, as it turned out, because he, he thought that attacking the United States, and he said this in our interview, when we did the interview with CNN in 97, he said the United States essentially is a paper tiger, very similar to the former Soviet Union. He based that analysis on the American pullout from Vietnam in the 1970s, the American pullout from Beirut in 1983 after the Marine barracks attack, and the Mogadishu incident in 1993. 
but you know, we're not going to pull out of Washington and New York because we're attacked. I mean, the whole thing was crazy. And the whole idea that America would pull out of the Middle East because we've been, you know, 3,000 of our civilians have been killed on a Tuesday morning going to work. I mean, it was a crazy idea. And he completely underestimated the American response. And it's very interesting, I say in the book, hmm. that this was, at the, if you go back to 9-11, a lot of people said this is like Pearl Harbor. So, and it is like Pearl Harbor, but it's not like Pearl Harbor. You know, it, the Pearl Harbor was the end of Imperial Japan. You know, if they hadn't attacked us, the Japanese, on, in, on December 7th, 1941, you know, it, the, it, the, the history would be very different. Um, and Al-Qaeda s- scored this great tactical victory against the United States on 9-11, but it led to their strategic <laughs> defeat. They didn't get what they wanted, and they themselves are basically out of business. And Al-Qaeda mm-hmm. means the base in Arabic, and they lost this base they had in Afghanistan, and we obliterated them. Yeah. Did the CIA by then uh, know how important he was? Because there, there had been a special bin Laden unit since uh, 1995 under Michael yeah. Shoyer. Yeah, I mean, in fact, the National Security Archive, which is a nonprofit organization in Washington, has done a very interesting set of Freedom of Information Acts uh, uh, and has got some documents that indicate as early as 92 that the CIA was looking at al-Qaeda and somebody called bin Laden. So even 92, 93, there was beginning to be an interest, and that's why they set up the unit you refer yeah. to. Yeah, which uh, an interesting detail about it is that it consisted mostly of women. Why was that? It was for a few reasons. Uh, Michael Scheuer, who ran the unit, basically think, thought that women were better, smarter, better analysts, you know, didn't take cigarette breaks, didn't tell war stories, <laughs> you know, were just better. <laughs> and, you know, and so... He, he, in, in my book, I quote him, he says, you know, I wish I could put up a sign saying no man need apply. And so there was, and also at the time, ter- terrorism was seen as sort of a backwater at the CIA. It wasn't seen as like the really important stuff that people did. And of course, that changed after 9-11. But yeah, there were a lot of female analysts who were um, involved in thinking about al-Qaeda. And were they good? Because it's it's amazing in your book. I mean, there were a few instances before 9-11 where he was inside this, this, this infamous cruise, cruise missile attack on, on a camp, which he apparently just left before that. Uh, but, but it's, again, amazing to read the number and the urgency of the warnings the CIA gave the Bush administration in the summer of, of 2001. Uh, yeah. Ending with this famous August 6th briefing after which the president went on holiday. Yeah, well... I mean, it, how good were they? Well, they were, you know, I mean... There was a story in the New York Times today that's getting quite a lot of attention by a guy called Kurt Eichenwald, which underlines something that I have also written about in this book and other and another book, and is also implicit in the 9-11 Commission, which is the CIA was constantly warning in the summer of 2001 about an attack on the United States. And these warnings were very, very strong. And uh, there are multiple memos. Uh, I only have the titles of the memos. Uh, in my book, because they haven't been... They're pretty revealing. They're pretty revealing. But they, you know, you know, you know, Bin Laden determined to strike, of course, is a famous one in the United States, but there were a lot of, there's a lot of information uh, the CIA was very concerned. And anybody who was tracking this was very concerned. In fact, I wrote a four-page letter to a, a, I didn't remember this for months after 9-11, but I wrote a four-page letter to somebody I know at the New York Times, John Burns, and uh, late August of 2001, saying, I think there's something very big brewing, and here's the reasons why. And I gave him a sort of laundry list of why. And he actually wrote a piece that was going to be in the New York Times on September 9th, 2001, because of a dispute over editing. It didn't get in. But it, there was, there were, you know, Bin Laden gave an interview to the Middle East Broadcasting Corporation on June 25th, 2001. And he was, he was kind of in a bind because he didn't want to... The Taliban had told him to stop making all these threats against the United States, but he also wanted to indicate that something was happening that he was somehow responsible for. And he gave this interview, and people around him you know, said something along the lines of, you know, we've got something very big for American and Jewish interests you know, in the next several weeks. So, you know... It, so what essentially went wrong? Well, I think it was a policy failure, not an intelligence failure. Hmm. Um, it was presented as an intelligence failure because, but of course, intelligence is not information. Intelligence is we think something's happening somewhere, you know, we can't give it a date or a time. Um, and 
you know, I think that if you look at the President, President George W. Bush administration, their concerns when they came into office were Russia, China, Iraq, and anti-ballistic missile defense, which none of which have anything to do with terrorism. And, you know, the facts just speak for themselves. The first National Security Council that the George W. Bush administration had a few days after being inaugurated was on Iraq, and they didn't have a National Security Council meeting on al-Qaeda till September 4th, 2001, a week before 9-11. So, I mean, it's inarguable. They were not paying attention because it didn't fit their conception of what a threat would comes from. They thought about states as threats, not groups like al-Qaeda. Yeah. That changed, of course, after 9-11. I mean, uh, they, they took Afghanistan with the Northern Coalition. And they, they swiped away the Taliban. You write in your book that, uh, that Osama bin Laden and his, his uh, fellow uh, jihadists at al-Qaeda never expected that. What did they expect? They expected, after 9-11, the same thing that Bill Clinton had done, which was cruise missile attacks, which, of course, after which they survived, I mean, didn't have any effect on them, and maybe at worst, American airstrikes. They just did not expect what actually happened, which was 300 American special forces on the ground with 100 CIA officers who, in combination with the Northern Alliance, overthrew the Taliban in three weeks. And in fact, the New York Times wrote a piece about two weeks into this saying, you know, this is another quagmire like Vietnam, and, you know, of course, you know, it was quite the opposite. It was one of the great, and I give George W. Bush great credit for authorizing this. It was one of the great unconventional victories of, you know, modern arms. People, you know, the Taliban was a not insignificant military force. They continue to be a not insignificant military force. And this was very effective. But at the Battle of Tora Bora, where bin Laden disappeared, this kind of approach basically did not work. No. Because there weren't enough American soldiers on the ground. In the book, I say there were more journalists at the Battle of Tora Bora where bin Laden disappeared than American soldiers. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, there were about 100, American journal 100 Western journalists there, and there were about 70 American soldiers. And in the book, you also say that it was Tommy Franks, the chief of staff, who personally rejected to uh, send in more troops. He did. Now, I, I dodged the draft, so I'm not an expert on military matters, but uh, <laughs> that sounds like insubordination to me. Well, I mean, in what sense? Uh, that he personally refused to send in troops that Rumsfeld wanted to have in. Oh, well, I don't think Rumsfeld wanted troops in either. Mm. I mean, I think that they were all very concerned. I mean, Tommy Franks wrote me a very de detailed email about this issue, and he said that um, they weren't sure for a fact that bin Laden was at Tora Bora. That is not true, I'm afraid to say. Um, there was were. overwhelming evidence he was there. There's radio transmissions with his voice. CIA asked for a Ranger Battalion, which is 800 guys. Um, Tommy Franks turned it down. There was concerns. Uh, this is very hard to recall right now, but there was a really kind of casualty averse culture in the US military at the time. The last war the United States had been involved in was the Kosovo War, which there were no casualties. Somalia, where the 13, 18 American servicemen was killed, you know, really kind of that was the lens through which the US military saw a lot of things. And they were, at this time in the Afghan war, more journalists had been killed than American soldiers. Uh, so, and that, this is all very hard to recall now that we've had the Afghan war with two and a half thousand American soldiers dead and four and a half thousand in Iraq. But that was the mindset. And there was a great concern about not repeating these mistakes of the Soviets. Um, and, and also, frankly, there was, uh, you know, Donald Rumsfeld instructed Tommy Franks the day, the day that bin Laden disappeared from Battle of Tora Bora, Tommy Franks was having a very lengthy meeting about the Iraq war plan, <laughs> which ran 800 pages long. And uh, Donald Rumsfeld had asked him to really revise it. Uh, so, yeah, it was one of those sort of great what ifs. Uh, that, you know, arguing against what I've just said, even if you put a lot of American soldiers into Tora Bora, it's not clear that you would have necessarily stopped bin Laden. <laughs> He knew the place like the back of his hand. He had a house that he would go, that he lived in there. Uh, Tora Bora is not a place you would choose to put your house. Uh, but he, he actually you know, moved his family there in the 96, 97 period, and they lived there like medieval peasants without electricity or gas. Or, um, so he knew it very well. Um, and he, of course, disappeared there. Yeah, yeah we know that he disappeared. And uh, like you just said, uh, in fact, after he disappeared there until somewhere around, I think, September 2010, nobody know, knew 
where he was, right. not in the CIA, not Michael Shoya's women. Um, when, to get to that, when did they start having a clue and how did it start? Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti was identified by the 20th hijacker as somebody in al-Qaeda, in, uh, and this is somebody who was coercively interrogated. He said that he was trained by this guy, Ahmed, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, on how to use the internet in sort of a covert manner. And this was sometime in 2002, 2003. A guy called Hassan Gul was arrested in Iraq. He was also coercively interrogated. He said that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti was bin Laden, was a courier for bin Laden. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11, was waterboarded, as we know. Uh, 183 times. Yeah, yeah. many times. And uh, he gave up false information about Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. And his successor as the number three in al-Qaeda was also coercively interrogated. He also gave up false information about Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. So coercive interrogation produced perhaps useful information and also false information. But the fact is, is that this interrogation, WikiLeaks was very useful for my reporting on this because the um, WikiLeaks has the summary of people's interrogations at Guantanamo. So they summarize hundreds and hundreds of interrogations. And, and that basically, I was able to, you're able to piece together some of this from, from these documents about who said what at what point. So Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti is a subject of some interest. In 2007, of course, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti means the father of Ahmed from Kuwait. And there are millions of people who come from Kuwait. And lots of them have kids called Ahmed. So it's not a very precise. Um, <laughs> and then in 2007, the Pakistanis give the real name. I think I, in my book, I say a third country. I could never prove it was the Pakistanis. But he is, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti is not a Pakistani. He's not a Kuwaiti. He's a Pakistani who grew up in Kuwait. Uh, in fact, you know, as you know, Kuwait doesn't give citizenship to people who aren't, you know, if you're, you're no. treated as a second-class citizen who come from a country like Pakistan, live in Kuwait. So this guy had grown up in Kuwait, which means many spoke Arabic, which was very useful for communicating within the senior leadership of al-Qaeda. And he was actually a Pashtun from northern Pakistan, which is the area in which bin Laden disappeared. And so he was the ideal person to be protecting bin Laden. Now, none of this was clear at, in 2007. They got the real name. Uh, but he's just one, Ibrahim Saeed something is also quite a common name in Pakistan as a country with 180 million people. And sometime in 2010, in the summer, they intercepted a call from Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti to a, somebody in the Gulf. And it became clear from the content of this conversation that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti was still a member of al-Qaeda, it seemed. Uh, and that he was living in Peshawar, Pakistan, or he, this phone call was in Peshawar, Pakistan. This guy was practicing very careful operational security, and he would not only turn his phone off an hour away from where he lived, he would take the battery out. So eventually they put people on the ground who followed this guy from Peshawar, Pakistan, which is a major Pakistani city, two and a half hours drive into central Pakistan to this mysterious compound in Abdabad, in August of 2010, Leon Panetta briefs the president and says, this compound is pretty interesting to us. It doesn't have internet, it doesn't have phone, it's a little bit bigger than its neighbors. And it seems we think that it's not impossible that bin Laden's living there. No one gets very excited in the Oval Office about this because a few months earlier, you may recall, uh, there was a, a Jordanian triple agent who presented himself as an, an, a potential mole inside al-Qaeda, blew himself up, and killed seven American CIA employees and contractors in eastern Afghanistan. And he was, he presented himself as the best lead into the leadership of al-Qaeda that had come along in years. So when Panetta said this to President Obama and others in the Oval Office, there was you know, interest but not... No one sort of said this is, you know, yeah, we, well, you know, no one was doing high fives. It was, it was a very long way from, you know, trying to, you know, trying to get the information that's really Osama bin Laden was there. And of course, they never got it. I mean, the CIA set up a safe house in Abdabad. They counted how many lawn, how many women's clothes were on the laundry lines, how many men's clothes. They put satellites over this place. They put drones, stealth drones, over this place. And they could never get a picture of bin Laden. Um, in fact, at one point, Leon Panetta, I mean, there's some, there's some very kind of, kind of interesting stories in the book. 
Liam Panetta says, are, right? <laughs> yes. Liam Panetta says that the National Geospatial Imagery Agency, which basically does what it, its title suggests, which is you know take pictures, uh, <laughs> that <laughs> that okay, if we can't get a picture of this guy, let's get a let's measure his shadow. He's well known to be six foot four, which I guess is 193, 194 centimeters. And they, the National Geospatial Imagery Agency comes back and says, we've measured his shadow. He's between five foot three and six foot eight. <laughs> so so they, you know, they keep coming in. You know, and Liam Panetta also goes to his guys. Jeremy Bash, who's Liam Panetta's chief of staff, says, you know, Panetta, was, he's an Italian guy. He's you know, an amazing man, very, got a great sense of humor. But uh, he was getting very angry about how you know we're not getting anything with uh, we're not getting inside the compound, and he, Jeremy Bash, the chief of staff at the CIA, told the people at the, in the Bin Laden who were hunting Bin Laden. He said, "Look, come up with 25 ways, you, you know, just, even if they're crazy, to like get Bin Laden out of, to find out if Bin Laden's in this compound." And they came back with 38, and two, you know, a couple of them were completely ridiculous. One was. They would set up a loudspeaker outside the compound, and they would broadcast the voice of Allah in Arabic, demanding that they leave the compound. <laughs> Another, <laughs> and the other, you know, and then they would throw stink bombs into the compound and get people out that way. So, but Panetta was, you know, the, and some of the some of these ideas were serious, and one of them, of course, became uh, something that I think was certainly creative, if ethically dubious, which was to mount a fake vaccination program inside Abdabad in an effort to get DNA from the residents of the compound. And of course, they recruited this doctor, Dr. Shaquille Afridi. He didn't know he was looking for bin Laden. He just thought that the CIA had hired him to do you know, this vaccination program. And he, they, never got, they never got DNA from the residents of the compound. But so Panetta was satisfied that every avenue was being, you know, every avenue that it, you know, into the compound might you know, was being followed uh, after this discussion of the 38 ways to perhaps get bin Laden, mm. get a picture of bin Laden, or real information. Nevertheless, they, they, they never uh, got closer than a range between the experts from 30% sure to 70% sure that, that he was there. And that was, in the end, as far as they could get. Because it's an intriguing process, because the more information you try to gather, the bigger the danger that you blow your cover. Correct. So you so, have to stop somewhere. And I think you know people around President Obama told me that by January of 2012, he had become, I think, somewhat bored by this discussion about how can we improve the intelligence. I think he'd come to the conclusion that it was unlikely that the intelligence picture would ever be improved because the only way to improve it, as you said, as you said Chris, was to take risks that, that would basically blow the cover of the whole operation. And one of the, I think one of the most telling quotes in the book is Mike Morrell. The very, when you write a book, of course, you want to have characters who are in the, the that, that you can follow throughout. And in fact, because this thing took place over 10 years, very few people remain part of this story throughout. I'll bet Osama bin Laden obviously is one of them. But one of them who is, is Michael Morrell. Who, Michael Morrell was briefing uh, President Bush on 9-11 and was the first person to have a very substantive conversation about al-Qaeda on Air Force One at around 10.30 on 9-11, 10.30 a.m. Um, and now he's the deputy director of the CIA. And President Obama asked him in the course of the discussion about Abdabad, why is it some analysts are at 50% and some are at 70? What, why, or 90? Or, and uh, Morrell said basically that it's really a kind of almost a generational thing. The people who are following bin Laden really believe this is bin Laden. The people who live through the weapons of mass destruction fiasco in Iraq are very skeptical of the circumstantial case. And then he says, which one of the great quotes in the book, he said, Mr. President, in terms of the data available, there was a better circumstantial case that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction than the circumstantial case that bin Laden is living in Abtabad. And if I was the president, I heard that, I would be like, okay, well, <laughs> this, is, this sounds very, very risky and, and iffy. Um, and at the end of the day, the percentages gave a false sense of, because for the president, I mean, Bin Laden's either 100% there or 100% not there. There's no, he's not like 40% there. So, so that's, that, you know, these percentages kind of gave, I mean, they were interesting, but they, in the end, they're not helpful ultimately to making a decision. Uh, you have to, a decision is essentially a, is essentially a gamble. And one of the things I try and say in the book is I think that 
President Obama is a very deliberative gambler. I mean, taking on Hillary Clinton was a huge gamble at the time. Uh, you know, she had all the money, she had all the name recognition, she had all the Democratic Party machine, and yet he was willing to take that, that gamble. Uh, Libya, I mean, it was an intervention that he got a great deal of uh, criticism both on the left and the right for, and you know, we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but it's turned out pretty well, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell. Uh, so this is a guy who uh, does take calculated risks when necessary. Oh. And it, but apart from the fact that he had to take the decision to do something, he had, yeah. he had different options, because like right. you said, Biden and, and uh, Gates were against this option, uh, some were uh, in favor of a drone strike, others wanted to, to throw a daisy cutter, uh, <laughs> things like that. I mean, yeah. well, the, the options they had are, different decisions to make. Yeah, the options, you know, basically there were four options. A B-2 bombing raid, when people looked at what, 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 what it would require, it would be 32 500 pound bombs, which would be like a small earthquake going off in a fairly substantial Pakistani city and that was quickly dismissed. The second option was a joint operations with the Pakistanis. That was relatively quickly dismissed because the relationship had you know, really declined by then, and there was real concern that it would leak if the Pakistanis had the information. The third option was a drone strike with a experimental bomb, a uh, very small munition. No one would tell me directly what it was, but they kept saying it was very small, and I'd asked them, well, was it 500? The smallest munition the United States Air Force drops usually is 500 pounds. And they were, people were saying, no, 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 some very, very small. And uh, I looked into, you know, um, you know, it turns out the Raytheon is, made, is developed a nine-pound bomb. Um, and I think it was this kind of bomb that would have been attached to the drone. Now, the problem with this was there was some of the same problems with the drone strike were also true of the B-2 bombing raid. The B-2 bombing raid, you have no evidence that bin Laden is killed, and you have no intelligence collection at the compound. The drone strike, you have, you may miss when people also walk away from drone strikes, um, you know, even if they are hit, you may get the wrong guy, you don't get the body, you don't get the intelligence. Admiral Mike Mullen um, was very opposed to this. He said, we've over-relied on technological, we, we, you know, as a, as a nation, we sometimes rely on technical solutions and we should do the raid. We should have boots on the ground. And so boots on the ground was the other option. And uh, in the end, that was the option that the president went with. Yeah. Now, um, you, you already mentioned uh, uh, the, the JSOC, uh, the Joint Special Forces Command, um, and uh, uh, Admiral McRaven, so let's not get into him, although he's a, a larger-than-life figure in your book, which I found very intriguing. I'd love, love it if you would write a book about him next mm. time. But um, let, let's, let's go to this, this famous picture uh, in uh, which... I got from your book is an annex to the Situation Room in, in the White House. It's a smaller room. It's not the actual Situation Room where Obama and, and Hillary Clinton and uh, Panetta, uh, no, Panetta wasn't there, but they uh, were watching something. We couldn't see what they were watching. There was right. a lot of debate then about what they were actually seeing. But from your book, I understand that they were actually seeing some form of live coverage of the action. Well, I quote Hillary Clinton in the book saying it was like watching an episode of 24, which, um, you know, um, and uh, they were clearly, I mean, and I think she meant by that, you know, that it was, you know, nail biting and, you know, remember the picture of her with her, her ma hand yeah. over her mouth. I mean, clearly what the picture that they're watching at the time is from a stealth drone. It's a RQ-170 stealth drone, the same one that the Iranians either shot down or were able to interfere with its uh, navigation and uh, uh, relatively recently uh, displayed in Tehran. And these, this stealth drone was feeding back um, video of the outside of the compound, um, but not video of what's going on inside. So, and there was no video of what was going on inside. In fact, I think there was a decision, and I didn't, I, I, I didn't put this in the book because I didn't have it completely nailed down. I think there was a decision not to have video of what was going on inside. Um, because? I'm not entirely sure. Um, but um, I, I, I understood that there, was, there even was a discussion if the president should be able to follow the action this close because right. some of the military were afraid that he would... Well, start micromanaging. There was, there was a very, very lengthy discuss, discussion about the White House, should the president be watching the operation as it unfolds. And there was basically there was a kind of consensus that he shouldn't because uh, the image that he, it might appear that he was micromanaging something. 
he might say or do something that, you know, while watching it that would be, I don't know, embarrassing or something. And so the, you know, the idea was the reason they're all jammed into this tiny little room is there would be people monitoring the operation in this room from special forces, but not the president or his staff. They would be in the situation room and they would be, you know, eating sandwiches or something and <laughs> waiting. <laughs> And, uh, you know, curiosity is a very strong human force. And so when it became clear that people, you know, there was ability to see this operation or hear it, uh, people started coming into this room. And, uh, and, and they, that's why they're all jammed into this tiny little room. And, uh, yeah. You write in your book that there is, especially the moment when uh, this first helicopter goes down in, in the compound. Yeah, um, that that was a moment that Obama could have been tempted to 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 start micromanaging. Well, and he obviously didn't do that. Yeah. Was I, that uh, courageous that he didn't do that? Well, this is. I mean, I quote Mike Mullen, Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, in the book. He says, you know, part of you know we have this situation that's unprecedented, where for technical reasons the president can basically be monitoring a military operation in real time. I mean, this would not have been possible. <laughs> Uh, you know, if, from their point of view, they they saw this helicopter go down. Yeah, they and they were yeah. So, you know, Mal Mike Mullen, it wasn't about the president when he, he he's quote he he said, look, if somebody started micromanaging, it wasn't just the president. It could have been all sorts of other people in the mm. room who could have sort of intervened. He said, you know, I was going to throw my body in the way of that uh, to make sure it didn't happen. Um, and and you know, it didn't happen. Um, and uh, the operation continued. Um, but clearly, you know, it was very lucky that that helicopter went down in the way it did, um, because if it had gone, if it, it if it had fallen on its side and you know the dozen seals inside were severely injured, I think the operation would have basically failed. Mm. Yeah. Now, but another part of the operation, the actual killing of uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, in, in your account, he was shot in his room after the SEALs entered. Uh, we've recently been told in, in, in the book written by one of those Navy SEALs, uh, Matt Bissonnette, who writes under uh, AKA Mark Owen, that he was shot through the head uh, on first side uh, when, he, when he put his head out of the bedroom when the SEALs were still on, on the staircase. Um, do you think he's right? Well, let me sort of start with two observations. One, my account and his account are substantially similar about the following issues. One, the helicopter goes down immediately. Two, um, they kill the courier, his courier's brother, the courier's brother wife, Khalid bin Laden, and then Osama bin Laden. Uh, that takes 15 minutes. During that 15 minute period, bin Laden doesn't surrender. During that 15 minute period, he really doesn't do anything. He's got two guns in his room, he doesn't reach for them. Um, and it's kind of a passive, unheroic ending. Uh, the, di the difference, as you point out, Chris, is that a few in, 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 Mark, in Bissonnette's account, bin Laden was killed a few seconds earlier before he, not in his bedroom. That may be true, but the second point uh, is this is an event that happened on a moonless night, and there's no electricity on in the house or the neighborhood, and all the SEALs are wearing night vision goggles. And it, this is a pretty confusing scene. A uh, helicopter has just gone down. There's been a firefight earlier. Um, people are very, you know, pumped up on adrenaline. So, an eyewitness accounts of these kinds of things, I think, are often, you know, mistaken. Hmm. So, I'm not saying his account is wrong. In fact, I reviewed it for the Washington Post. I gave the book a very favorable review. And I'm not saying that my account is right. Uh, I'm saying that a full accounting is yet perhaps to be done. Hmm. But the bottom line is his account and, and my account, when I say my account, the account of everybody that I interviewed, of which there were dozens of people who were monitoring this operation, is pretty similar. Yeah. You, you were in the house. You were the yeah. only non-intelligence, non-military outsider to, to visit the compound. Yeah. Um, did what you see there reinforce business story? Yeah, I mean, in fact, the physical evidence tends to discount uh, his version and, 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 and tends to support the, let's say, official version, which is when I went to the Bin Laden's bedroom, uh, it's a very low ceiling, and there was a huge splatter of dried blood on the ceiling, suggesting that somebody was shot while standing up uh, through the, through the, through the, uh, in, in the head, which is kind of what the official version says. So, you know, I, I don't... 
I don't want to say he's wrong. Um, I, I would say that physical evidence suggests that his account may not be complete. Um, and the bottom line is, I think that the uh, accounts of what happened are pretty similar overall. Four men and uh, a woman were shot, two women were wounded. Of all these, correct me if I'm wrong, only one was uh, a wanted man. Is that in, in the literal sense of the word a just operation? Well, you know, that's a determination I think that people in this room individually can make. Um, let me start with the uh, uh, point that I think it, it, this is a very common question in Europe, but not at all a common question in the United States. And certainly bin Laden didn't um, sort of worry himself too much about the civil rights of the 3,000 people he killed on 9-11, nor indeed of the thousands of other people that al-Qaeda has been responsible for murdering uh, over the years. So I think the kind of, I think it's a little misplaced to have a, a, a really, you know, um, deep uh, worry about bin Laden's civil rights. Um, so that's my first point. But the, over, my second point is... Um, you know, bin Laden had 15 minutes to surrender, and he didn't. And he, there was a contingency operation. There was every contingency for this operation was thought of, including a captured bin Laden. And a captured bin Laden would have been taken to Bagram Air Force Base outside Kabul. He would have been interrogated by FBI, CIA, Arab linguists. There would have been doctors there. He would then have been flown to the USS Carl Vinson, which is a big American aircraft carrier off the coast of Pakistan. And if it could be kept secret, they would no one would explain that. You, that they would never say that they had bin Laden for months. They would have interrogated him for a long time because they've done this with other members of al-Qaeda in international waters off the coast of Somalia. Of course, you know, bin Laden didn't surrender. And in Mark, Matt Bissonnette's book, there's a very interesting sequence where the SEALs ask a lawyer who's come down from the White House or the Pentagon, can we, you know, is this an assassination mission or not? And the, the lawyer says, you know, if bin Laden conspicuously surrenders, you know, comes out with his hands up, in his underwear, you know, you have to, or you know, you have to detain him. And I think that's not peculiar to this operation, any U.S. military operation, mm -hmm. where somebody conspicuously surrenders. But that didn't happen. Um, and uh, the other people on the compound, while they may not have fired back at the seals, uh, they all had AK-47s. Um, all, the, all the military-age males were had arms near them, and in one case, either did use them or didn't use them. I'm not sure. So, you know, I. I, I don't share the kind of concern that some people have that bin Laden's civil rights were somehow violated. So how's al-Qaeda doing without bin Laden? I mean, they were doing terribly before bin Laden's death. Bin Laden's death is just a giant punctuation mark on a big story, on the bigger story of al-Qaeda becoming irrelevant. If you look at opinion polls in the Arab world, well, around the Muslim world, Indonesia, Jordan, Morocco, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Al-Qaeda and suicide bombing and groups like it are losing the war of ideas for a long time because they're killing a lot of Muslim civilians. They're not offering anything positive. For, you know, they, they have no positive vision of the future. They're basically saying your problems will be solved if you have a Taliban-style regime. Most Muslims don't want that. And um, they've made a world of enemies. Every kind of government is against them. Every civilized institution is against them. They've killed journalists. They've killed aid workers. They've killed people working at the United Nations on a repeated basis. I mean, these people are outside the sort of civilized uh, realm. And uh, so, you know, I think they've lost the war of ideas because of their own actions. And uh, not because the United States is loved in the Muslim world, but quite the opposite. America is widely disliked still. Uh, but Al Qaeda lost the war of ideas. And um, the Arab Spring was a huge kind of controlled experiment on that issue. I didn't see a single picture of any of the millions of protesters in the Arab world carrying a picture of Osama bin Laden. I didn't see a single American flag being burned. I didn't see a single Israeli flag being burned. America uh, and Israel and Al Qaeda were kind of completely irrelevant to these events. And they were just you know, people wanting justice um, and, and uh, sort of fair opportunities in life, which had been de denied to them. And the really big story here is it's not an accident that so many people in Al Qaeda are Saudis and Yemenis and countries that are, come from countries that aren't free. Because I think in freer societies, the people who might have been tempted to join a jihadi group like Ayman al Zawari, the new leader of Al Qaeda, who joined a jihadi cell in Egypt when he was 15, they will just engage in conventional politics. And we had a discussion um, earlier today about, you know, 
are Salafis a problem for the West? And I, I'm personally not a Salafi, but I'm not convinced that nonviolent Salafism is a big problem. Mm -hmm. I think that um, you know, it's, it's violent jihadism is a problem. And if it sort of just morphs into conventional, if Salafis engaging in conventional politics, to, to me, that's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, that is not a national security problem for the, for the West or the United States. Which opens up a whole field of new questions, but I'll <laughs> leave it at that. Um, anybody in the audience? Please, yes. He suggests that they see a shadow flitting across the stairs and they didn't shoot bin Laden, but somebody shot him. And could it have been someone close to bin Laden himself to uh, make sure he wasn't captured or someone from the Pakistani Secret Service? Uh, no, I mean, it's, he was shot by, in, in Bissonnette's account, he is shot outside his bedroom by the point man, which is the first man up the stairs on the SEAL team. Um, there's no, there were no, there's no evidence the Pakistani, you know, there, no Pakistani officials knew that bin Laden was living there, and uh, do you, yeah. Do you, do you honestly believe they didn't know that? Uh, it's not a matter of belief; it's a matter of evidence. And um, you know, we, the United States, has retrieved um, several thousand documents from the Abbottabad compound, all of which have been translated. If there was a smoking gun, you know, U.S.-Pakistani relations are not so great. Believe me, we would have pointed it out. And I talked to multiple people uh, who were listening to conversations that night between the Pakistanis were having, who talked to the Pakistanis. The Pakistanis were very surprised, in fact, and they were angered that we didn't uh, give them a heads up about the operation. And uh, there's no evidence. And by the way, Al-Qaeda tried to kill General Musharraf, the Pakistani president, on two occasions in December of 2003. Al-Qaeda was at war with the Pakistani state. Bin Laden's a very paranoid, secretive, disciplined guy. There's, why would he tell anybody in the Pakistani, um, you know, officialdom what he, where he was? It didn't make any sense. And, and one final point here, the courier's wife, who was living on the compound there for several years, she didn't know bin Laden was living on the compound. You know, bin Laden was being really careful, and uh, the courier had told his wife, there was a stranger here that you can't discuss, and uh, I'm not going to tell you anything about it. So he was hiding from people on his own compound. <laughs> Forget about, you know, telling people in the Pakistani state. There's, there's just no evidence for this. Over there. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting stories. I look forward to reading the book. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're basically saying Al-Qaeda is finished. Don't worry about Al-Qaeda. But what about uh, copycats of Al-Qaeda? other groups that may have grudges against the United States, Israel, the West, capitalism, the whole array, who may learn from Al-Qaeda's mistakes and change their tactics somewhat so that they are not killing fellow Muslims. I mean, what about, you know, there are a lot of fragile states in the world today, not just Afghanistan and Pakistan. There are plenty of places where groups could be regrouping. Do you have any thoughts on where there are other groups, what might be happening, or are you suggesting this is the end of these kinds of terrorist groups? Let's look at Mali, for instance. Right. Well, you know, terrorism as a form of warfare has been around since the dawn of time. Um, and I'm not saying that terrorism as a kind of form of warfare is going to be abolished, but I am saying that al-Qaeda and groups like it are no longer really a national security problem for the United States, by which I mean they're not capable of doing anything on any large scale. And when I, and I, when I, when I say the United States, I think the West in general. Um, you know, here we are, Mohammed Bouhari uh, killed Theo Van Gogh in 2004 or 2005. I mean, nothing's happened since then here. Um, in fact, to me, it's surprising how little terrorism there is in Europe, given the fact that most Mus many Muslims in Europe do not enjoy uh, the kind of lives that Muslims in America enjoy, for instance. And Muslims in America tend to be better educated than most Americans. They tend to have higher incomes. They don't live in ghettos. And you can basically reverse all that uh, when it comes to Muslims in Europe. Um, and in fact, there's only been three significant attacks. One was Madrid in 2004. One was London in July 7, 2005. And Theo van Gogh was significant in a sense because he was a public figure. But, you know, that's not, a, a, it, it's, it, 
it's not a really a record of great success by these jihadi groups. And in fact, since, Amer since 9-11, 17 Americans have been killed in jihadi terrorist attacks in the domestic United States, 13 of them at Fort Hood, Texas in 2009. More Americans, well, 25 Amer about two dozen Americans every year get killed by dogs. Um, so you're 10 times more likely to be killed by a dog than by a terrorist since 9-11, and you're much more likely to drown in your own bathtub. Uh, 300, Americans, 300 Americans accidentally die in their bathtubs. I mean, so we don't, have an we don't have a sort of irrational fear of bathtub drownings. We shouldn't have an irrational fear of terrorists. And I think that if you look at what, I mean, just to look at the United States for a minute, on 9-11, on since we're on the 11th anniversary, on 9-11 there were 16 people on the fly list. Now there are 20,000. On 9-11, the CIA and the FBI were barely talking to each other. Now they're highly integrated. On 9-11, you know, there are now 2,000 plus analysts at the, at, the CIA, at the FBI. The FBI acts much more like an intelligence operation than simply a law enforcement operation. On 9-11, there was no Department of Homeland Security. On 9-11, there was no Transportation and Safety Administration. There were no TSA. On 9-11, the public wasn't aware this is a problem. The people who, dis who, did, who, who tackled the... Uh, Nigerian who was flying from Amsterdam to Detroit on the plane, it was the passengers who said that something seems wrong about this guy. So there's a kind of public understanding that this is a problem. So the situation is so different now than it was 11 years ago. And sure, people may learn from Al-Qaeda, um, you know, or, or try and imitate it, but Al-Qaeda had an entire state at its disposal uh, in, in pre-9-11 Afghanistan. It had thousands of people training. It had access to resources, it had a very effective leaders. Uh, you know, it's very hard to imagine any kind of terrorist organization in the future, in the, you know, in the, in the foreseeable future, replicating that in any kind of meaningful way. Do you think there's any kind of uh, operational link, because you describe in your book how Al-Qaeda, <coughs> bin Laden himself, uh, does give his directions to, uh, for instance, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and in Yemen. Do you think there's any operational link to someone like al-Zawahiri and al-Shabaab in Somalia or al-Qaeda in the Maghreb in, in, in uh, uh, Mali Touareg country? You know, I think it's very hard for these groups to communicate now. Um, but they do communicate through the media. So Ayman al-Zawari just released another, vi another videotape yesterday, the leader of al-Qaeda. Um, and so you know, he's able to kind of get his message out. You know, in American military terms, there's something called... But only on that level, not on a, no, on not a not military on, operational level? Or no, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's very, very difficult for these groups to communicate directly now. Okay. Anybody else? Um, hi. So this is just a question. Um, so basically, why is it that being number two in Al-Qaeda seems to be like getting a red shirt in Star Trek? I mean, you immediately get killed, it seems, like every couple of months number two is replaced by a new number two. What is it about the structure? What was it about the structure of Al-Qaeda that came about, uh, had that happen? Well, it's particularly the number three uh, job, which is sort of the operational job, has been very dangerous for people. Um, because that's what the CIA really focused on. You know, and what I quote somebody, in the, there's a very interesting quote in the book. Phil Mudd, who was a deputy director of counterterrorism at CIA, said when they were meeting in 2004, 2005, uh, every day with George Tenet at 5 p.m., the discussion wasn't about Osama bin Laden and Ayman al Zawari, the number two and number one. It was about who was the, the number three, because the number three guy was the guy who was doing the operations, and that was the guy that they were trying to find. Uh, so, you know, that was the reason that it's been a very dangerous job is the United Which States. Which was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed at the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and then Abu Faraj al Libi and there have been mm -hmm. a whole slew of others. And so it's just been a dangerous job because if you're, you know, you're, a, to be operational, you have to, you know, be out there and be in communication. And so it's easier to find you. Um, and there was a very strong interest in finding these guys. Hello, uh, Jeroen Diels here. Thank you for your fascinating uh, account. Uh, I have a question um, about the other uh, family members of the uh, bin Laden uh, family. There's this uh, narrative that shortly after uh, the attacks, uh, you know, the air was cleared, obviously. Uh, nobody was allowed to fly. Uh, but um, as word has it, uh, the bin Laden family was actually, um, you know, given safe passage. But my first question is, is this true? And my adjacent question would be, if it is true, uh, what kind of a security interest was you know, met there in order for, to allow that to happen? Because it seems kind of strange, actually. 
Well, let me start with the observation that bin Laden has 53 siblings and probably several hundred first cousins, and it's a big, very big family. And I, I think a quarter of bin Laden's brothers and sisters studied in the United States. Bin Laden's oldest brother, Salim bin Laden, was sort of somebody who was dating a lot of American women. He had a house in Orlando. He was playing the guitar. He was an amateur pilot. He was a very different person. Mo many of the people in the bin Laden family are actually quite pro-American. In fact, at Harvard, there was a bin Laden chair of architecture. Uh, the bin Ladens, a lot of them had a family houses in Orlando. Um, and so the fact that there were bin Ladens in the United States at the time of the 9-11 attacks is you know, not surprising. And it, I think it is, a, it is a fact that they were allowed to go home. I think there was a concern that they would be attacked. Um, even though they had nothing to do with this. You know, bin Laden was, in 1994, the family cut all ties to him. So I don't see a sort of sinister conspiracy. I think it is, it, the 9-11 Commission gets into quite some detail about this incident. I think Dick Clark, who was then the counterterrorism coordinator at the White House, authorized a flight for people who were members of the bin Laden family to get out of the United States. I mean, I don't see that as sort of a sinister thing because there's no evidence that any of these guys or people involved on on a flight had anything to do with Bin Laden himself. But why was why did he approve of it? Well, you'd have to ask him directly. But mm, what um, do you think? Well, I think that I mean, there was some legitimate concern that these people would be, you know, lynched. Yeah, or that they. And you know, I think that they were they were cleared for a flight that they I'm sure they paid for. I don't think it was U.S. government that flew them out, um, but they I think there's some evidence this happened. Hi. Yeah. Over there. Over there. Hi. Nice. Could you spin up? Hi. Uh, could you please tell us a little about uh, about Bin Laden's character, about what type of person he was? You know. <laughs> I, I've talked to a lot of Bin Laden's friends and family members, and the account that you get from a lot of his family and friends, you know, he's a family guy, modest, unassuming, et cetera, <coughs> relatively intelligent, not a genius. Um, and it was always puzzling to me, you know, it's not an unassuming act to authorize the murder of thousands of civilians in, in New York and Washington. And so why is it this guy who's described by his friends as somebody who's kind of modest and low-key and unassuming, why is it that he also did, you know, that he's involved in authorizing very evil actions? And uh, the answer, I think, came from a guy um, who knew bin Laden well, who's a Libyan who lives in London. His name is Noman bin Oatman. And he said that bin Laden subscribes to a kind of ultra-fundamentalist view that it's okay to be, you know, if you're Muslims, you know, he'll be kind of okay and pleasant to you. And if you're a non-Muslim, he won't. And in fact, Bin Laden's repeatedly said, um, one of his great, one of his lines is that essentially taking Christians and Jews as your friends is a huge mistake and you shouldn't and it's against Islam. And this is, so he, the guy is a religious fanatic at the end of the day. And he was a religious fanatic from the age of 13. His idea of kind of fun was to bring a group, a group of guys aged 13 around to his house and they would chant religious songs about Palestine. He would um, fast twice a week, pray seven times a day. And so he's a, at the end of the day, he's a religious fanatic who really believed that he was on a mission from God uh, and that what he was doing was um, fulfilling God's will. And so that's the most important, I think, understanding to have about him. Um, I think, yeah, he, he, his, his, his religious beliefs kind of initially were he was a zealot and he turned into a fanatic um, and he began also to believe that, you know, he ran al-Qaeda as a dictatorship. He didn't, there were people in al-Qaeda who said that attacking the United States might not be a good idea against Islam. It might anger the Taliban. It might bring a lot of retribution from the United States, and he just ignored all that. So over time, he became this religious fanatic who didn't listen to good advice. Um, and, and many of his friends kind of stopped dealing with him at a certain point. So maybe this Allah loudspeaker wasn't such a bad idea in the end. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't totally crazy. Okay, over there. Um, <clears throat> uh, the fact that bin Laden was shot instead of being captured probably saved the world and the United States a long trial that would have been maybe ugly and complicated and for a lot of people very painful, I can imagine. 
and it would have just led to the death penalty anyway. On the other hand, if he had been captured, perhaps valuable information could have come out of the trial. Perhaps al-Qaeda would, would have lost a lot of prestige because its leader was being humiliated and demeaned in the public eye. What do you think? Was it better that he was shot, or would it have better, been better to have him on trial? I think, you know, I, I as an, somebody who's been following this for a long time, of course, I would have liked to have seen him go on trial because I think it would have been fascinating. But I don't think it was going to happen. I mean, bin Laden repeatedly said to his bodyguards, you know, here's a pistol, you've got one bullet for yourself and one for me if the Americans come. I mean, he wanted it. He didn't want to end up in Guantanamo. It wasn't going to happen. Um, I mean, so it's an interesting what if, but I think, he, you know, he, he didn't want to be captured himself. He wasn't captured. Uh, it didn't happen that way. Given this account of uh, Bissonnet that he was shot at first sight, do yeah. you think it was ever an, an option to capture him? Yeah, I think it was. I yeah. mean, I mean Bissonnette's own account is he was instructed by a lawyer that this was an option. Uh, I don't think it was very likely to happen, but it was certainly an option. Okay. Over there, in the back. Sorry. Um, great talk, thanks. Um, so after 20 years, um, what, what did you feel at the moment when, they, uh, when you heard about his death? And secondly, what are you going to do now? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I'm like a Sovietologist in 1989, which is I need to find something else to do. And um, that's a good thing. I mean, presumably, if you were a Sovietologist, you were happy about the collapse of the Soviet Union, not, you know, un, you, know you didn't say, oh, well, where's my career? Uh, so, you know, I'm happy that bin Laden is dead, al-Qaeda is over, it's great. Um, you know, there are many other interesting stories out there. Uh, how did I feel when he died? I didn't feel anything. I mean, to me, I, was, I wasn't... I was at CNN, it was a huge news story, and I was there to kind of try and elucidate to the best I could of what was happening. Um, and I don't feel anything about it now. I mean, I just, it, he is dead, and I think the world is a better place. I'm sure much mates wouldn't leave it at this answer, but I'll, I'll leave it at this. I have one more question from the floor, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Over there, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the role of the Pakistani state has come in for a lot of discussion post the death of Osama bin Laden and the role they played in either supporting him or just tolerating him on Pakistani soil. Do you have any comments or thoughts? Well, it's the same comments that, that I gave to the lady who asked the question in a different way earlier. There's no evidence that Pakistan tolerated or supported bin Laden uh, in, in Pakistan. It, you know, it's very hard to prove negatives, but I can just tell you that the evidence doesn't exist. Pakistan didn't support him or tolerate him. Um, and that's, you know, uh, in the absence of evidence that suggests otherwise, I'm going to continue saying that. OK, I'll take the liberty to ask the really last question. I asked, how is al-Qaeda doing uh, uh, without bin Laden? But uh, how is Obama doing? Will it get him reelected? Well, I think it takes off the table something that's traditionally regarded as a Republican strength. In, in August, Reuters did an opinion poll in which Mitt Romney was behind by 12 percentage points on, on the issue of national security compared to Obama. That's a pretty comfortable lead. And, um, you know, it turns out that the Democrats are strong on national security, which is not something you normally would say. Um, so I think the, econ the economy is clearly the question the uh, election is about, but the Repub how, how do you get to the right of President Obama on national security? You'd have to, like, nuke Iran. <laughs> and, I mean, Don't say that out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Mitt Romney has been very vague about, he's been critical on the issue of Iran and on Syria, but he has never said what he actually plans to do. There's no appetite in the United States for another war in a Muslim country right now. Um, and in fact, Robert Gates, one of the last things he said before he retired as Secretary of Defense, you'd have to be, you have your head examined uh, to get involved in another land war in a Muslim country. So uh, that's Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. Um, so there's, you know, I, I think it's very, very hard for the Republicans to be, to critique him on this issue. And at the end of the day, you know, he did make this decision, which was an important one. Um, and um, I think most Americans understand that killing Bin Laden was a good thing. Thank you very much, Peter Bergen.
I would just like to say that uh, this was a, a terrific talk and, and discussion, which was one uh, take, one use of all this material. The book itself, for those of you who haven't read it, is really quite something different, uh, because Peter accomplishes this very difficult task of crunching all of this data and really weaving it into a narrative, which moves back and forth from the White House to the, the Al Qaeda, and uh, it really is a narrative. So uh, thank you for the book, Peter, as well as for uh, being here. I would also like to thank Chris Kaina for doing a wonderful job, House of Books for bringing uh, Peter Bergen here, uh, and uh, some of our uh, main sponsors, Aegon, the Holland America Friendship Foundation, the U.S. Embassy, DHR, Ahold, PricewaterhouseCooper, Google, McKinsey, and KLM. Uh, upcoming events, uh, September 25th, we have uh, an event with Franz Verhagen, uh, the first Dutch biography of Abraham Lincoln in 50 years or, or so. Uh, October 11th, uh, debate on the U.S. election, uh, Republican Shane Jett versus Democrat Gary Nordlinger. Upcoming after that, uh, Chris Zook, Gail Lemon, and Madeleine Albright. Um, uh, get, uh, Peter will sign books out here, and if I can ask you all, before you jump into the aisle, let me kind of whisk him out so he can be there ready for, 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 uh, for you all to sign books. Thank you all very much for being here.